Hi, my name is Josh and I am a um, foundation doctor in Bristol. This is part of a 10 minute medicine series and today's teaching session is about being on call. There'll be two scenarios that we're gonna run through, common scenarios that I've encountered on my on calls and throughout the session we'll be asking you to pause the video to think about some of the answers. So the first scenario, you're an evening AMU cover doctor, you get bleeped at five o'clock and this is the bleep. The nurse picks up, says, hi doctor, it's one of the nurses from Ward 7. We have a patient here who's in a lot of pain. She has paracetamol and codeine written up PRN and she's had a max dose. Would you mind reviewing her? Her name is Betty in bed 34. She said, fine, that seems very reasonable to review and you review the patient. It's an 85 year old female, admitted for a fall today and um, has a fractured fourth, fifth and sixth right rib. Pulse pointing history, CKD, hyponatremia, osteoporosis and hypertension. Social history, lives alone with a BD package of care, usually on ramipril and a statin and doesn't have any allergies. Drug chart, sure enough, has paracetamol and codeine written up QDS. Um, ramipril and atorvastatin are written up as well. So, based on all of that information in this patient, what would you do next? What further information do you need and what potential drugs could you use? Pause the video and have a little think. So you look at her new score. What is she scoring? So she's scoring a, scoring a one. Her heart rate is 110, um, and, but she's in pain. But actually, you know, you've got to think about, is this, is this pain new? Review the patient fully. Take a full history examination. It might be the patient has chest pain that you need to, you know, get an ECG and, and do a troponin for if you're worried about it. It might be that this pain is completely out of proportion, completely new to what it was earlier. Now, in this patient, she's saying, actually, you know, the patient is, the, the pain is much the same as it was earlier. It's just, a, you know, the codeine's worn off. So you're not too worried about the source of the pain. It's coming right from where the ribs are fractured. You see the bruising on the ribs. Let's have a look at the, the blood stem. So the bloods are largely normal, but you notice that the EGFR is 25. So with all of this now information in mind, what analgesia is best for the patient? Pause the video and have a little think. So this, this scenario is slightly tricky because not only do you have a patient who is 85, you have a patient who has rib fractures and you also got a patient with an EGFR of 25. The first thing to mention is rib fractures are really important to manage the pain because you know if they don't if they're not taking deep breaths in they're at risk of hospital acquired pneumonia and 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 in that patient cohort that can be really dangerous can be in hospital for weeks so we need to get on top of the pain relief the second thing is she's 85 so using lots of opiates in them is you know highly constipating and can cause things like delirium as well so you've got to be careful from that respect and the third thing is he EGFR is 25. So things like morphine are, you know, a bit of a no-no when the EGFR is sort of less than 30 in this sort of this area. They're at high risk of opiate toxicity, respiratory depression, and, and everything that comes along with that. Regardless of the EGFR, when you're prescribing morphine, it's always a good idea to, um, to, to, to put naloxone in the PRN section so that the nurses can give it immediately. The other thing I sort of forgot to mention is actually this EGFR is normal for the patient. It's not like an acute deterioration. She has CKD, EGFR of 25 is very normal for this patient. So what sort of things to consider? First, let's consider the non-opiate type analgesias you could use. Now in rib fractures, typically, typically some, something that we use is a lidocaine patch, 5%. We could put a couple of patches on typically for 12 hours over the day and then they take it off for 12, 12 hours. You can use sort of one, two, three patches over the area of the bruising on the ribs. And this can be a really effective pain relief um, for this patient cohort. You typically use that for something like a week, five days, something like that, and it could be really good. Second thing to consider is NSAIDs. Now in this patient cohort, given that they have CKD um, and given that they're sort of, uh, in the older sort of cohorts, that wouldn't necessarily be appropriate. High risk of, sort of GI bleeding and the cardiovascular side effects along with co COX inhibitors. Other drugs we could consider are things like codeine, which the patient was on. Now with an EG a low EGFR, such as the patient's Taking them off codeine would be a reasonable thing and prescribing a more appropriate analgesia would be better. So what are we gonna use? One option is um, oxycodone and a half-life in oxycodone with someone with a normal renal function is something like sort of two, three hours and someone with end-stage renal failure is something like three, four, five hours. So it still does accumulate. There still is a risk of opiate toxicity with oxycodone, but it's much reduced. 
prescribing something like 2.5 milligrams QDS of oxycodone and some 2.5 milligrams QDS in a PRN, so regular and PRN section, would be an appropriate first step to prescribe in this patient cohort. Next thing you could consider is using something like tramadol. In low EGFR, we use something like 50 milligrams three times a day, but Tramadol in an elderly patient is not a very nice drug. It's constipating, it's delirium uh, genic, so it can cause delirium. It has serotonin effects, noradrenaline reuptake effects. It's a, quite a dirty drug to use. So in this patient cohort, we sort of don't favor it. There are other drugs such as fentanyl, particularly the fentanyl patch, and things like hydromorphone, 1.3 milligrams, would be a very reasonable energy in this cohort. So for this patient, get a lidocaine patch on them, perhaps prescribe some oxycodone and re-review the pain regularly because they're at high risk of hospital acquired pneumonia. After that, getting an acute pain team referral, getting the specialist pain team in would be a really great idea. Managing the pain early on is really important for their recovery. So that's scenario one. So let's move on to scenario two. You're a weekend wall cover FY1. Eight o'clock in the morning, you've just started. You get a bleep from ward two. Hi doctor, the patient in bed 60 is scoring a nine and doesn't look so good. Would you mind reviewing them? So first thing to, to mention is, you know, the nurse says this over the phone, what sort of questions are you going to ask them? What are they scoring for? Um, what were they scoring previously? If they were scoring an 11 previously and they're now nine, that's an improvement. What can they do while you get on the way to the ward? You know, could you get an ECG, take some bloods, do a VBG? Those are the sort of things that, that asking a nurse might be appropriate, to, you know, if they have time. So you ask the patient, ask the nurse about some details of the patient. So they're a 67 year old male. They're admitted to hospital with sepsis secondary to a diabetic foot ulcer. They've been in hospital for two weeks, treated with IV TANS for seven days and then stepped down to Comox for five days and they were stepped off antibiotics two days ago. They did develop an AKI and they're out for bloods this morning. So with this in mind, what the nurse has told you, what are your differentials? Pause the video, have a think. So you arrive on the ward and you reassess all the ops there. So news of nine, oxygen stats 92% on 15 liters non-rebreathe mask, respiratory rate 32, blood pressure 109 over 60, heart rate 110, and temps 37.5. What additional information would you want now? So I find with these sort of patients, when you arrive on the ward, before you even getting there, you're thinking, what are the differentials? What are you gonna do? What are the sort of actions that you're gonna have to take? When I get there, I usually eyeball the patient. If they look okay on news of nine, then I might take some time to have a little read through the notes get a bit of a background history about why they were there to, to get a feel of things. If I eyeball them and they look really awful, then I might sort of go and review them quickly and get sort of senior input in quickly um, before necessarily taking a long time to look at the notes. So that's just based on experience. But you have a look at the notes. So diabetic, hypertension, peripheral vascular disease and AF, they're on metformin, ramipril, statin and warfarin. Don't have any allergies. The bloods were actually reasonably okay, apart from that AKI that was mentioned. And on the ward round yesterday, they uh, had a block catheter and had poor oral intake, which is probably the cause of the AKI. And they were given some Hartmann's prescribed over eight hours each. So with everything in mind, what are you thinking now? What are your differentials? And what are you going to do next? So as with all these patients, um, we think about the differentials from there. So, you know, it could be sepsis. They were stepped off antibiotics two days ago. Could be fluid overload. Could be a PE. Uh, it could be a pneumothorax, you know, all the causes for a, an acute respiratory deterioration uh, and a drop in oxygen sats and many, many other causes as well. So what are you going to do? First off, airway. Assess the patient's airway. Are they able to speak to you? Um, are they making any added sounds? And this patient, their airway was patent. They're saying just sort of one word really, but they can't complete full sentences. Breathing. You know their um, respiratory rate is high. You have a listen to their chest. You hear just crackles and perhaps low sort of um, uh, air intake at the bases, but you're not really too sure and they're not really happy to move around that much. Circulation, you know the blood pressure's okay, the heart rate's high, um, they're perfused peripherally, uh, cap refill time's under two. So they're perfusing well, but they look fairly unwell. 
disability, a GCS, you've got to assess, having a think about their blood glucose uh, and everything else, of doing a full examination of the patient, uh, temperature as well, worth mentioning. So in this scenario, and this is based on a, on a, on a scenario I saw in the wards, um, got IV access, took some bloods from that, um, the patient didn't have IV access, getting an ABG, so look at the respiratory function, there's sort of acute deterioration there, and getting a portal x-ray as quick as I could as well. And then contacting my registrar for, for that senior support in this patient as well. So you get the ABG, find that pH is, is fine, the PO2 is 20, but for on 15 litres non-rebreathes, that's a relative sort of under oxygenation. Sodium is fine, lactase 1.5, Glucose is 7.1 and, you know, they don't have a raised bicarb or base excess. So, you know, not really at risk of type 2 respiratory failure. This is like a type 1 respiratory failure, um, uh, you know, an acute deterioration in this patient. You get a portal x-ray and that shows sort of interstitial alveolar edema consistent with fluid overload. So in this patient, we treated with sort of IV frizomide, 80 milligrams. So I got all this information together, the x-ray, the ABG, the bloods, the background history, spoke to the registrar on the phone, recommended sort of 80 milligrams of IV frizomide. We treated them and half an hour later, they were much improved. In this patient cohort, there are other sort of things we can consider such as GTN infusions, but that's all sort of what you consider um, after speaking to your senior. So that was two scenarios um, I've encountered on my own calls. I hope that was useful. Do check out the other videos on 10 Minute Medicine. Thanks very much.